know your name, I know you great Yeah, 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 yeah. Control my life, so I put my trust in you. You control my life, I put my trust in you. I know your name, I know your grain. Bad vibes can't even come my way. I'm just tryna serve, God, bring that place. Back in the days, couldn't find my way, but I know you got me. Ain't no love like you and me. So I was blind, but now I see. Why got all this case on me? These are some of the other big Christian celebrations. Is how. People just take an interest in that one service and then forget about God the whole year. And for me personally, I think that's one of the biggest disrespects to God. You must as well just not, not come at all. Uh, to think and come on one of the most amazing days where we recognize the resurrection of Jesus and say, yeah, I'm going to come and celebrate that. But really and truly, it's going to have no impact in my life throughout the year. And I'm so happy that you are here and you haven't done a runner. And that you recognize that actually the resurrection is important. It's the reason why your sins have been forgiven. It's the reason why you were saved today. It's the reason why you have a smile on your face. It's the reason why even when things are difficult in your life, you still come and you still fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. It's so important that we don't make the resurrection a one year, one day a year event. This is every single day. This is something we must honor and celebrate and talk about. Amen? So we're here today on Sunday, and we're going to worship God. We're going to fellowship with each other. Let's not for, forget the reason why we come here. It's actually to get to know each other, to, to fellowship. We're here to sing songs to God. Even if you don't have a good voice, you are allowed to sing. <laughs> You're allowed to sing publicly here, and you won't be judged. Just don't sit next to me. We're allowed to sing to God, and of course, we get to hear God's word, his infallible word preached to us, to encourage us, to enlighten us, and to equip us for his work. Amen? So before we start this service, I just want to read from the book of Daniel. Um, as men, uh, we've been studying the book of Daniel in our men's um, group, and a couple of weeks ago, we studied Daniel chapter 2. If you remember Daniel chapter 2, you remember that this is the time when Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream, and he had no one to interpret that dream for him, and he commanded that all of his magicians, all of his fortune tellers would be killed if they don't tell him his dream and then interpret the dream. And we know that God used Daniel in such a powerful way, and he was able to reveal the dream to him and then interpret the dream, and Daniel, in a sense, saved so many people through God's sovereignty. And then Daniel begins to praise the Lord. And I think that this prayer is so powerful that really and truly we should memorize this prayer and pray it to God every so often. Listen to this prayer that Daniel prays to the Lord. He says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belongs wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He, remo he removes the kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To him, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. For you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what was asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. Amen. And I pray these are the kind of prayers, these are the kind of praise that we will give to the Lord once we recognize his sovereignty, once we recognize how powerful and how great he is. So let's pray this morning. I'm not sure of the week that you've had this week, whether good or bad. I pray that you still recognize that God is still on the throne. And today is his day. Maybe throughout the week it's been your day. You've put your interests first above his. You've 
haven't really spent much time with the Lord. But today is his day. It's his day to be given all praise and all glory. It's his day to speak so powerfully to us through his servant. So God, this is your service. And we just pray, Lord, you will speak to us so powerfully. God, you know every single person's situation. You know their struggles. You know their fears. And I love that you meet us in such a powerful way. That you're even willing to. And so God, we give you this service. We ask that your plans will prevail. And we will not get in the way this day. So have your way in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, during this time, I'm going to hand over to the worship team, and they're going to lead us into sang worship. Thank you. Amen. Let's all stand if we're able and worship together.
Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, let's just spend a few moments greeting one another, maybe greeting someone you haven't seen before, uh, wishing them a, a blessed Sunday or encouraging them in some way. Let's just do that for a moment. Bless you. Awesome. So I've just got a couple of announcements for us this morning. Um, so membership class, if you're here today and you're not yet a member of this wonderful, amazing church, honestly, there's no better church in Croydon than West Croydon Baptist Church. Do you agree? Yeah. Amen, amen. So if you're not a member of this church and you would like to know more about membership, we have a membership class next week, Sunday, um, straight after the service, and lunch will be provided. Amen to that. And, and this is where you get to hear a little bit more about the church, what we believe, and, and how you can be part of this amazing fellowship. So next week, Sunday, if you're even if you're not yet thinking about membership, but you want to know a little bit more about the church, please do come next week. We have baptism classes coming up again on Thursday, the 18th of April. And if you would like more information about this, please do come speak to myself or to DAPO. And there are sign-up sheets at the back of the church for you to sign up. And again, maybe you don't want to get baptized um, so soon, but you want to know a little bit more about baptism, what it means, um, I think this will be a really good class for you to come to. Uh, through the Easter break, we had a couple of breaks from our mission activities, but God still works even though we're taking breaks, amen? Uh, so the Wednesday Discovery Jesus group will return this Wednesday, the 10th of April, and Friday door-to-door knocking um, evangelism will also take place on the 12th of April. Uh, so if you're available and free to share the word of God in this way, uh, please do come along. And from the 3rd, I really need everyone to put this in their diaries, actually. Uh, from the 3rd to the 5th of May, we are partnering with a church in South Hall, which is somewhere in, in, in London. I'm not too sure where. I don't really know much of, you know, past the river. But somewhere in South Hall, there is a church called St. George's. And we're going to be partnering with them for, for three days, sharing the gospel. So they're going to come on our turf, and they're going to come and, and help us and encourage us to share the gospel in our community. And so the Friday is going to be more of a social, uh, where we, we're going to get to know that church. Um, we're going to have icebreaker games and, and eat a meal together with them. And on Saturday is the main day for evangelism. Um, we'll be um, having street evangelism and also door-knocking evangelism. And in the morning, there'll be a bit of training from LCM. And then on a Sunday, they're going to come, and one of the uh, members is going to preach God's word to us that day. Uh, so please, if you're uh, available that weekend, please do make an effort to come. Our football team. I need to take a drink for this. God is good, but we've lost every single game. Um, but we have a bit of hope that this game on Saturday is going to be a win for us. Um, yeah, feel free to clap. So we, we want to invite the church, and we've, we've only got two more games, and the season is finished. And so we want to ask if you're available to come and watch us. Um, Jordan, is it Norman Park? Yeah. Norman Park. Uh, we're, we're playing at Norman Park. Um, you can come speak to Jordan or, or Jason and get more details. At 1 o'clock kickoff, uh, it's going to be a sunny day, I believe, as well. I don't know how I know that, but I believe it's going to be a sunny day. Uh, and we're, we're praying for a win, but we want your support. I think the more cheers... The more excitement, the more church faces, I think it will make the men a bit more energetic as they play. So please, if you're available to come to one of our final games, uh, we're not in the finals, just one of our final games, I just want to make that clear, um, please do come next week. And I believe that's it for the notices. So we're going to spend a few moments in prayer. And I just wanted to pray for, for two things, two things that's been on my mind uh, this week. Um, I want to, to pray for, for us as a church. Um, one of the things that uh, a couple of us were praying about before we started the John series is that it won't just be another preaching series, but it'll be a preaching series that will have a huge impact on people's lives. The book of John is all about Jesus, and we know Jesus is the one who came to save us. And my hope is that even as Christians, we might have read the book of John so many times, heard it preached so many times, that the Lord will really do a powerful work in our lives. And, and as the word of God is preached, we won't leave this room feeling the same or feeling like we've, we've heard that message before, but it will really speak to us. And some of the new people who are not yet 
Christians, when they come and they hear the book of John preached, I pray that the Lord will bring them to himself. That's one of the things I've really been praying for uh, this week. And then I also want to pray for some of our members who, uh, who are sick at the moment. And I want to use uh, Peter Monk uh, as a point of contact for, for the many people in our church who, who are sick. Um, and he's in hospital at, at the moment. I mean, and he really needs um, our prayers. So I want us to, to pray for him and others in our church who, who are not well at this moment. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have to hear your word preached. Help us as a church never to take that for granted. We know there are places around the world that people have to meet in secret. Because every time they open up the Bible, their lives is at stake. And yet we can come here freely, not hiding, and we can hear your word preached. I also want to thank you, Lord, that there are men in this church who are really seeking to honor you through your word as they prepare to preach your word. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have, God willing, any false preachers in here. But this is a church that is trying to be as faithful as we can to your word. Because that's the only way it will have an impact on people's lives. So God, I just pray for your hearers, your children who come to Sunday every week to hear your word preached. One of the great amazing things about your word is that it's not dead. It's not a word that we hear once and don't need to go back to. But Lord, we can read one verse over and over again and you can speak to us over and over again. What a privilege that is, that your word is active, is alive, sharper than any two-edged sword. And I just pray, Lord, as we go through this John series, Lord, that you really pierce the hearts of your hearers, that it will be hearers and doers. I pray, Lord, we will not leave this room the same. When we feel convicted, when your word is being preached, help us not to brush that conviction off. Help us to sit on it and reflect on it and be challenged and wrestle with it. I pray, Lord, at the end of this series, Lord, we will see a huge multitude of people come to the knowledge of who you are. And I pray for the people who are preaching, Lord, that we will practice what we preach. We will not be hypocrites as we stand before you this day, Lord. So do a work through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And Lord, I just lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ who are unwell at the moment, Lord. Lord, you know them, you see them. I pray for Peter Monk, who's in hospital at the moment, Lord, with a severe infection, Lord. And I really pray for his healing, Lord. I really pray, Lord, you will strengthen him, Lord. I really pray, Lord, you will have a, a, a big hand on his mind, on his body, on his soul, on his spirit, on his whole being. Lord, I just pray that you would comfort him. He will sense your comfort. He will sense your peace in this difficult time, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that he will know he has a, a church family who, who are with him now, who are praying for him, interceding for him. I also pray for, for the likes of Margaret, who is also unwell, Lord. I just pray, God, that you too will comfort her, Lord. You will be her God. She is so faithful to you, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, you will just have your hand upon her. Give us strength, Lord. Ease the pain that she's facing, Lord. Protect her, Lord. And I pray for all the other church members who are in care homes, who can't physically come to this church. Help them to know, Lord, that they're not disqualified from you, Lord. That they're not far from you, Lord Jesus. That you are close with them, Lord. You are all present. God, be so near to them. Be so present in their lives. And help us as a church to, to be faithful to them, Lord. To serve them to visit them when they're sick, to pray for them when they need prayer for. God, we pray for this in your name. Amen. Amen. 
And so I'm going to invite the children and the young people to go to their classes. And, and before they go, actually, I just want to have another call out. We recognize that we're beginning to have younger children, babies, um, who are coming to the life of the church. And I really do feel it's important that we have a, a crash. We have a room ready. We have toys ready. We just don't have the people to help serve in that ministry. So if maybe God has been speaking to you about serving in the crash ministry, uh, please do come and speak to myself or speak to Roy. And we'll love to, to, to speak to you more about that ministry. Thank you. So let's pray for the children. We just pray, Lord, as the, the young people and the children go to their classes, Lord, that even though they're young and they have young minds, but Lord, that you would speak so powerfully to them. Help the teachers who will teach them today to know your word and to share it in a fun, relevant, and powerful way. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Praise God. I know it's quite warm in here, and it's always rare that we have a warm church. And sometimes with a warm church, it means warm eyelids that can often fall asleep. And so I pray that you will stay awake as David preaches powerfully to us this morning. Amen? And, and church, I, I wanna, I'm going to be reading from John chapter 4, verse uh, 34 to 54. And we're continuing our John series. But I want to start a new tradition in the life of the church. Um, I, I'm sure we all recognize that this, this word of God that we have is God's word. And we know from Old Testament time how people feared God's word, how people reverenced and respected God's word. And I want us to have a, an act of that. And so um, as I read God's word today, I want to ask you all to stand up. Um, as we read um, God's word. Uh, and to know that this is the word that has the power to change your life. It's not the preacher who has that power. It's the word of God itself. And we must reverence this, this holy word of God. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to John chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 33 to 54. And God's word says this. After the two days, he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. For they too long, they too had not long, to, sorry, for they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Canaan in Galilee where he had made the water uh, into wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed in the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. And as he was going down, his servant met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he had began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The, fever left him. the, the father knew that that was the hour that Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Amen. Please be seated. So I'm going to invite David now to come and share God's word. And let's just pray for him as he comes. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for another day that we get to hear your word preached. We thank you for another day that your servant has 
availed himself to be used by you, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that you will speak through him. I pray, Lord, he will only speak the words that you have commanded him to speak through your word. And Lord, help us to listen and obey your word. So use him powerfully this morning. Use him as your servant. Speak through him in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you guys. Hope you're all well. Major congratulations again, by the way, to everyone who was baptized last Sunday. What an amazing service that was. Uh, this is perhaps your first sermon as baptized believers, so I'm really praying that this blesses you and all of us who are here to the glory of God. Amen. Uh, once again, I thank the Lord for this opportunity to share with you from his word, something I don't take lightly at all whatsoever. And so, yeah, I really appreciate the prayer, Pastor Denzel. That way we've committed this into God's hands, and I'm praying that he will deliver this message to you and not me. Amen, church? Amen. All right. So fun fact about me, church, I have six nieces and nephews, three nieces and three nephews. And something that I've done that's worked on all of them and made me their most favorite uncle in the world is when they were growing babies, they didn't know me. They didn't know who I was. And so I knew I wanted to make a bond with them. So what I would do is I would show them a toy and they would draw near and I'd pick them up and place them on my lap. And or I'd give them food and they'd draw near and I'd pick them up and place them on my lap. See, my purpose ultimately was to show them who I am. I'd give them food so in hunger they'd be satisfied. I'd give them a toy or even my phone so in sadness they'd be filled with joy. I'd give them all of these things so that they know how much I love them, how much I care for them how much I can and will do for them, but ultimately so that they come to me, depend on me, rely on me, and have a relationship with me as their uncle. And of course, I have no children yet, otherwise I'd use this analogy as it relates to a father. But fathers, you know what I mean, and mothers, you do too. Eventually what would happen is my niece and nephew would no longer care about the, the toys or the phone or the food. They would just want their uncle David, and that would be enough for them. In a moment, church, we're about to dive into the text, and we're going to see Jesus as the miracle worker, and Jesus as the saviour of the world, and a question that I'd ask you, church, and please think about this throughout the sermon, is which one do you know him for? Now, just to recap, last time we were in the book of John, chapter 4, Jesus was speaking to a Samaritan woman who was so touched by her encounter with Jesus that she ran and told others that she had found the Messiah. And in John chapter 4, verse 41 to 42, which will lead us into our text today, the Samaritans say something very interesting about Jesus. It says in verse 41 and 2, and many more believed because of his word. They believe because of his word. Amen. They said, it is no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the saviour of the world. The Samaritans didn't say, we think that this is perhaps could be, maybe the saviour of the world. No, they said, we know that this is indeed, it is certain, it is definite, it is sure that this is the definite article, saviour of the world. David, you mean the saviour of the Jews? No, saviour of the world. Oh, saviour of the Samaritans? No, saviour of the world. Church, Jesus Christ is the saviour of the world. And that means if you're here today, no matter where you're from, Jesus Christ came to save you too if you would put your faith and trust in him as Lord and saviour. Here's a group of people who were able to take Jesus by his words and come to the conclusion that he's not just a prophet. No, he's more than that. He is the saviour of the world. And it'll be interesting to know the conversation that Jesus was having with these Samaritans but we know whatever it is he said was enough to convince them of the truth about who he is. And so we pick up today in verse 43. And speaking of Jesus, it says, After the two days he departed for Cana, uh, it, for, he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. Here's a thought, church. This verse is showing that the people who knew Jesus, who grew up with him, became so familiar with him that they failed to recognize him for who he really is. And this shows that it's possible to become too familiar with Jesus. And I wonder, church, have we got to that stage now today? Have we become so familiar with Jesus that we failed to recognize him for who he really is and what he's really done? Is it now, oh yeah, Jesus Christ, the face of Christianity, that man who died on a cross? 
Do we now say, oh, I'll come to church some Sundays just to let Jesus know we're still cool? I'll check in every now and then. He, he understands. Has the name, even the name Jesus, become so casual that we use it in our day-to-day, forgetting the weight that it holds? Two weeks ago, Rory shared a shocking fact that in Oxford Dictionary, one of the definitions used to describe Jesus and all Christ is a term used to express irritation or dismay. Oh, how we have taken Christ for granted. We don't cherish him as much as we should. Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 24, For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Church, we are blessed to be born in a time where we have the opportunity to know Christ, the long-awaited Messiah. But it seems that the noise of this world is often so loud, it drowns him out and reduces him to just the thought in our minds that lingers as someone we say we value but we haven't begun to die for. And the Lord says, these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And as Pastor Denzel said earlier, as, although we celebrated Easter last week, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, this appreciation shouldn't be an occasional event, but we should be in constant awe that the King of glory would come down and live a perfect life that we could not live and die a death that we deserve so we can be saved from eternal torment in hell and be reconciled, reconciled to a holy, holy, holy God. Therefore, as Christians, let us not become so familiar with our Lord that we take him as just an accessory or make him a part of our lives. No. He should be the very centre of our lives as we owe him everything. Verse 45. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all they had done, all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. Are you seeing the contrast, church? It's interesting. The Samaritans heard the words of Jesus but the Galileans seen the sign Jesus performed. And later on, we're going to unpack this and explore this further. But really quickly, it's sad that Jesus' own people, the Galileans, didn't welcome him because he's the saviour of the world. No, this is a very different atmosphere to the Samaritans and their encounter with Jesus when he was in Sychar. You see, these people, the Galileans, they're about the signs and the wonders. It's because of what they've seen that they've welcomed him. Church, can we call that belief in him? Can we call that faith? I'm not sure we can. See, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the words of Christ. You know, I've seen these videos, these videos online where these so-called evangelists are obsessed with making people's legs grow. I'm not sure if you've seen it, it's outrageous. I mean, they wake up in the morning and all that's on their mind, instead of it to be in the mind that I, I need to preach the gospel message, I need to preach Christ and him crucified, I need to make him known to people as Lord and Savior, These people wake up and think, I just need to make some legs grow today. (laughs) It's outrageous. You know, I've seen these videos where this guy will go to someone and say, hey, you want to see the power of God? You want to see how much God loves you? You're going to feel the Holy Spirit in three, two, one. (sighs) You feel that? You feel that? It's outrageous. And this victim will get so caught up in the moment that they fall prey to this question. Would you like to welcome Jesus into your life? And they say yes. They're not saying yes to Jesus, no. They want more of what they felt. They want to see more. No gospel was preached. This person wasn't made aware of their sin and their need for a saviour. And yet they're being asked to welcome Jesus into their life. It's no wonder we have so many false converts, people who say that they were Christian and they left Christianity. They were never a Christian. And what's even more sad is we have people who still think that they're Christian today because this is the Jesus that they were sold. A miracle, genie, sign performing, no saving Jesus, an accessory, someone that you can add to your collection of gods. This is not the Jesus that the apostles died preaching. The Galileans welcomed Jesus because of what they saw, not because of who he is, and the same thing is happening today. And so church, at this point, I'd like to ask you, why have you welcomed Jesus? And if you haven't welcomed him, what is it going to take? Verse 46. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. Church, I feel like I really need to comment on this water turning into wine sign. 
I just feel it's significant for many reasons. You know, I can imagine the conversation of people who witnessed this sign, some of them perhaps familiar with the Tanakh, and what, what would happen is they're, they're familiar with the Tanakh, and so they would, be, they would remember the Exodus account and remember that Moses turned water into blood. I don't know, but I, I imagine them having a conversation like, guys, you know when Jesus turned water into wine? I couldn't help but wonder, last Shabbat, Rabbi was talking about how Moses turned water into blood, and then the following Shabbat, he mentioned that a prophet would come and be like Moses. When Jesus turned water into wine, I was thinking, could this be the prophet? Could this be the Messiah? Nah, it's just Jesus. But hold on a minute, let's... let's dive into this let's explore this the exodus account is found in the old testament also known as the old covenant and see (sighs) that water turning into blood was significant for many reasons but in exodus chapter 7 verse 21 it says that the fish in the nile died in that blood now we know church that second corinthians chapter 3 verse 6 says that the law kills but the spirit gives life And although we know that Jesus was the prophet that was to come and be like Moses, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 3, says Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Why? Because Christ has come to bring a better covenant. You see, when Moses took the water into blood, the fish died, almost symbolic of man and our inability to keep the law. What we need is a saviour, someone who would come and fulfil the law, live it perfectly on our behalf. And so here comes Jesus, and the first miracle that he performs is he turns water into wine. But what does he say about the wine during the Last Supper? He takes the cup and he says, this covenant, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And we know that the blood of the new covenant brings life. And so although the fish in the old covenant died, in the new covenant we see Jesus bring these dead fish back to life, and that is those who would put their trust in the blood of the new covenant, i.e. the work of Christ and who he is, and so be saved. Hence Jesus telling the disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Even through his miracles, he is showing how he is saviour of the world, but people missed it. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. Verse 47. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Now, church, it isn't clear on whether or not the official was a Jew or a Gentile, but his response to Jesus being in town is significant. But suppose he was a Jew. This might be someone who heard the sign and thought, this could be the prophet that is like unto Moses. And I mean, if he can uh, turn water into wine, then surely he can heal my son. But what if he's a Gentile, a, a pagan, someone who served and worshipped other gods? That means that he would have prayed to these gods and that they, they failed to help his son. And so he's realised and acknowledged that there is no power on earth that can heal his son other than this man called Jesus. And so in desperation, as a last resort, He went to Jesus, trusting in his healing abilities. Either way you look at it, Christ is available for both the Jew and the Gentile. I also want to highlight, church, that this man heard Jesus is in town and travelled to see him as a matter of urgency in case he missed him. His urgency came as a result of the desperate need for Jesus to come and heal his son, come and save his son in case he missed him. See, This man's son was at the point of death. But church, we too were at the point of the second death, described in Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 as the lake of fire, until we came to Jesus and put our trust in him as Lord and Saviour. But sadly, there are many people today who are still at the point of death, and that's bad news. Because Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, then every day is a matter of urgency. For you too are at the point of death like the son of the official. But be encouraged, church. Because just as Jesus was available for the official whose son was at the point of death, Jesus Christ is still available to us today. And in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he says to all men, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Are you tired like the official was? 
Are you weary and burdened and hopeless like the official was? Perhaps you're religious and you're trusting in your good works to save you. And you cannot keep up and you hate yourself for it. Surrender. Put your trust in Christ and he will redeem you. He will save you. But don't take this invitation lightly. Because imagine if the official heard that Jesus was in town and procrastinated and said, you know what, I'll go tomorrow. Or, or the following week. Or, or the following week. Or imagine if he was a pagan indeed, then he prayed to Venus and said, you know what, let me try Venus one more time. No, you better seek Christ while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 48. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Church, picture this sign, picture this scene. Here is a man who is desperate for his son to recover. His son is dying. We don't know, but this could be his only son. And he's lost all hope. He's traveled 15 miles, perhaps on foot, to see Jesus, because it, he has in mind, if I could just get to this miracle worker, he could heal my son. As I've tried everything, and everything has failed, everyone has failed, all of them have given hope, but given up hope. But if I could just get to this miracle worker, if I could just, and he sees Jesus, and he approaches him, and he asks Jesus to come down and heal my son. And Jesus says to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now here is the heart and the matter, church. And I might spend most of my remaining time on this verse. You see, in the Greek, the word you is plural, is horao. And so it actually means you people. So Jesus is speaking to more than just the official, but a group of people who all they cared about was the signs, all they wanted was the wonders. They didn't care about who Jesus was. They didn't care about what he had to say. And if it sounds like I'm repeating myself, church, it's intentional because it needs to drive home that like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse four, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. This is the problem with the church today. Many of the attendants don't know who Jesus is. They may know of Jesus. They may even quote his famous sayings, like the pagans do, by the way. They may know of his miracles and holidays like Christmas and Easter. But when it comes to believing in him as Lord and Saviour and proclaiming him as the only one who can save, the only way to the Father, the only truth and the giver of life, when it comes to telling people this truth, it's suddenly, oh, now you mustn't be offensive. Just preach God's love. After all, we're all children of God. But that's not what the Bible teaches. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We need clarity on who we view the Messiah as. Is he just a miracle worker? Someone who performs signs and wonders? Or is he the saviour of the world? Now, don't get me wrong, I believe he is both. I mean, this is someone who commands the winds and calms the storm. He says to the sea, be still, and it obeys him. All of creation salutes him. But we cannot deny that there are a huge growing people, churches in fact, that are built solely on signs and wonders, yet no gospel is preached. There are even events called Miracle Night. Come and receive your miracle, your deliverance, your breakthrough. You have these false prophets who every now and then is in the realm of the spirit this, in the realms of the spirit that, yet no gospel is preached. They're not preaching Christ and him crucified. Where is the focus? You want to know why I take this serious, church? Why you see me and I'm, my heart is bleeding? I take this serious because one of the most terrifying passages found in all of Scripture comes from Jesus himself. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will come to me on that day. Some? No. Many saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name did we not drive out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Where is our focus, church? 
What is our relationship like with Christ? You see, in Luke chapter 10, verse 17 to 20, the disciples run up on Jesus and they say, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I've given you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the works and the enemies and nothing shall by any means harm you. But don't rejoice because of that. Don't rejoice because the spirits submit in your name, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 to 24, thus says the Lord, let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches, but let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord, and I exercise justice, kindness, and righteousness on earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Our focus, church, should be on knowing Jesus, being known by him, and making him known to others. In the beginning of my sermon, I said that I would show my niece and nephew toys and, and, and give them food. But the problem is, so can an imposter. So if they didn't know who I was, if they only still cared about the toy and the food, then they will be deceived. They wouldn't be able to tell the difference because their focus is not on who, who Jesus is, who I am. Their focus is on what they can get. It doesn't matter who it's from. The problem with craving signs and wonders is you can be deceived. You can idolize them and make them a god. And the food that the devil gives will poison you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 says that, uh, there is such thing called lying signs and deceptive wonders, like Pharaoh's magicians, like Simon the sorcerer. My point is, church, what good is it receiving the miracle but not knowing the one who performed it? Or believing and seeing the sign but not knowing or being aware of the one who's showing it? Do you really need the signs and wonders before you believe? Or are you aware of the sufficient sacrifice Christ made on your behalf that you owe the debt to God that you cannot pay and Jesus Christ paid it for you? Simply put, church, is Christ enough? Verse 49. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. This official is persistent. He is desperate. And he is confident that the Lord can heal his son. He's not discouraged by Jesus' response. He says to Jesus, come down before my child dies, thinking that Jesus needs to be there. He needs to see it. But Jesus is about to blow this man's mind and let him know that his words are just as powerful as his being there. Verse 50, Jesus said to him, go. Now church, remember, this is a tired man. This man is, he's tired, he's probably sweating and he's seen Jesus. And this is where all his hope is right now. And Jesus, the first thing he says is, it's not urgent. He's not like, disciples, let's go. He's, he's not, it's not an urgent response. He says, unless you believe, or unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And then he tries to not let that phase him. So he continues to ask. And then Jesus says, go. If that pause had been any longer, this man probably would have collapsed. I imagine his heart sinking into his stomach, thinking that all hope is really gone. But then he hears the heavenly words, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke and went on his way. There's a hymn that says, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus says the Lord God, who created the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. If he says your son will live, then he will live. For Lamentation chapter 3, verse 37 says, who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord commanded it? Jesus says, go, your son will live, proving that he has authority like no other. If the words of Jesus is powerful enough to make a dying boy live, how can it not be just as powerful 
when he says to you that if you believe in him, you will have eternal life. But whoever the Son shall set free is free indeed. The man believed in Jesus' word. Here is a shift. This man is like, like now like the Samaritans. He's taken Jesus' word, believing in his word. This is now a demonstration of true faith. And let's see where it leads him. I'll read the rest of the passage as we close. Verse 51 to 54. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. It's amazing, church. The son of the official, the, the son of the official's life was saved by the son of God who is about to lay down his life. Wow, you can almost say that the official son is representative of us. That's 52. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, and that's what we know is 1 p.m. today, by the way, the fever left him. The father knew that that was the hour when Jesus said to him, your son will live. Spot on. It was absolutely spot on. And he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. It's interesting. Verse 50 says that the man believed Jesus' word. But verse 53 says that when he saw... And when he saw that this was the hour Jesus said, your son will live, he himself believed. This is different to when he believed in Jesus' word. This is now him too believing that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And we know this because his household came to the same revelation. And this is parallel with Acts chapter 16, verse 30 to 31, as it relates to the jailer and the salvation of his household. But isn't it incredible, church, the weight of Jesus' word and its power Again, I tell you, if, if he can make a dying boy live, I'm just saying live, then how much more do you think he means it when he speaks to us today through his recorded words? We have the words of Jesus right here. We have it. And he says, if you believe in him, you will live. You will have eternal life. John chapter 6, verse 63 to 64, Jesus says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Hmm. Lord, help us. Hmm. You see, at this point, when Jesus had said this, he had gained a huge following. And then many people dispersed because they didn't like how Jesus was talking. They didn't like what he was saying. He said it was too hard for them to accept. And then he turns to his true disciples and he says, will you too leave? And then Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we believe and are sure that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. John chapter five, verse 24. Jesus says, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. And so in conclusion, church, we have seen three types of people. You have the Samaritans who knew Jesus and were confident that he is the Messiah, the savior of the world. You have the Galileans who welcomed Jesus and you have the official who came to Jesus. So questions I'll leave you with are, how do you know that you know Jesus? That's question one. Question two, why have you welcomed Jesus? And question three, what have you come to Jesus for? Remember, as Jesus hung on that cross for you and I, many mocked him saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from that cross and we'll believe him. Even then, people wanted a sign. But little did they know, Jesus is doing his greatest work yet. 
dying for the sins of man and would rise again on the third day, defeating sin and death. It's in this work that we put our confidence in. On Christ, the solid rock we stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Whether it's a sign or a wonder, if Christ is not preached and him crucified, you will drown. So then, let us remember, we have received the greatest miracle. That's new life in Christ. In this, God is glorified, and that's really all that matters. So no matter what you're going through, you can be rest assured that although you cannot trace his hand, you can trust his heart, that he is good, he is precious Jesus, saviour and friend, and because he says to us, live, we will live, and so will we live with him forever. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God. You are holy, holy, holy. Because of what you've done, Christ, for us, because you purchased our redemption, we have been given the opportunity, Lord, to be reconciled to holy, holy, holy God. What great gift we have received. But often, Lord, we are so caught up with the things of this world, things that don't matter, that we forget to just hold you in reverence. And even your word, Lord, forgive us for taking you for granted. Forgive us, Lord, for having our priorities mixed up, Lord. You should be first in your kingdom and his righteousness. Lord, forgive us. And draw us closer to yourself. May we never lose sight of who you are. Let us be confident in the work that you have done. Thank you, Jesus, for saving us. May your name be glorified always and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 David, thank you so much for allowing God to uh, really illuminate God's word to us today. God, God bless you. And I really pray for all of us that this won't just be a, you know, this was a really nice sermon that I, I got to hear today and then carry on with your lives. Now, I really pray that you will know Jesus for who he really is. And, and you think that you, you might think that you do know him, but, but as David said, how do you know that you know Christ? How do you really know that? And I just pray that we will be a church that's really seeking to know Christ for who he is. Because unfortunately, there are many false Christs, false representations of Christ, a false Jesus that have been preached on pulpits. Uh, that is a blasphemy to the Lord Jesus. Uh, but I pray that you will know Christ for who he truly is. Amen. So we're going to continue to worship Jesus. So I'm going to invite the, the worship team to, to lead us in our last song. And during this time, we're going to continue to worship Jesus also through um, giving to him. Uh, and that's giving of our offerings to him. So uh, we're going to do those two things now. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, David, for sending that word to us. But let's all stand if we're able and continue worshiping.
Amen. Yes, Lord, it's all about you, Lord. And we pray that we will make it all about you, not just sing it this morning. But we'll make it all about you, Lord. Our lives, our church, our everything, Lord. To, to your glory. Amen. Amen. Church, it was a blessing to, to be with you all. And I really want to thank the, the worship team for, for leading us so powerfully this morning. And I want to thank David for bringing us God's word. God bless you, brother. You. And for the welcome team and everyone who made this service possible, the AV team, God bless you. There was no interruptions today. Bless you. Now, if you're here for the very first time, we don't want to embarrass you. We just want to give you a gift and welcome you. Can you just wave at me if you're here for the very first time? Just wave at me. And we just have a gift. Good to see you. Bless you. It's just, just over here, Julie. Yeah, just the, this side. I just want to let you know that in your little goodie bags that we have, uh, there is a voucher for £10 at our amazing bookshop at the front of the church. And um, if you want to know more about the bookshop or the books that are there, speak, please speak to Mope, Esther, or Sadie. So we're going to share the grace with one another. We're going to enjoy the wonderful weather. It's a bit windy, so hopefully we don't get blown away. Um, but I hope we enjoy the, the week. And I hope that we can continue uh, to meditate on these words. One of the encouragements I will give you is every time the word of God is preached, go and reflect on that text for the rest of the week. So it really di will digest in your spirit and God will continue to, to speak uh, to you. Amen. So let's share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Uh, I'm still going to be around if you, you were impacted by the sermon and you want to know more about Jesus. David is around. Um, Dapo's around. I'm around uh, for you to come and speak to. God bless you. Thank you. Be gracious to you. 